This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is John Cameron and Richard Field. Gentlemen, cancel culture has exploded in the news this week, and it's gone everywhere from what Abe Lincoln to Dr. Seuss to Pepe Le Pew, and it's not a left or a right issue. We've watched cancel culture kind of evolve on both sides of it, and that's what's really dangerous with it is there's actually no controlling sense. It's just this kind of out-of-control cultural phenomenon. It's, uh, you guys have anything about that? The, the, the thing that interests, interests me about the whole, uh, whole uh, concept of cancel culture is the left wants to uh, cancel their opponents on the right. The right wants to cancel their opponents on the left. And by cancel, we mean shut them up, uh, deny them a forum, deny them jobs if possible, uh, make them into non-entities. And the, the ironic thing is that there's not very much difference between the right and the left when it comes to the issues that matter. I'm talking about the economy. I'm talking about fiscal policy, monetary policy. The issues that actually have an impact on the average person's life are almost exactly the same. Foreign policy, whether you have to, whether you have to send your, your kids to war or not, very similar between left and right. Biden is already uh, launching strikes into Syria. Uh, simply, simply because the the, uh, the establishment or the deep state or whatever you want to call the people who actually control the levers of power, whatever you want to call them, they have their own agenda. They keep us uh, fighting with each other on uh, superfluous issues, and we'll talk about some of those superflu superfluous issues today. But you know, one of them is Dr. Seuss. Another one is whether or not uh, uh, Mr. Potato Head is a may. A, Mr. or Mrs. or, or neutral, you know, all, all kinds of silly stuff that really has no impact whatsoever on the way people actually live on a day-to-day -day basis. It affects their uh, sense of what's uh, acceptable, their sense of what's, uh, what's uh, you know, should be aired in the public square, but it has no real effect on people's lives. But we spend all the time about about minutia and none of our time paying any attention to what's going on on issues that, 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 that really count and cancel culture simply accentuates all that. Uh, that said, I'm against cancel culture. I think it's a, what, a method of, uh, of uh, eliminating free speech that's to be decried. Well, I'm for cancel culture as long as I get to be in charge of it. But uh, you can do the cancel. And, and no, I'm, I'm against it as well. And I, I think you know, you say the left and right are both guilty of it and, and all the rest of that. I, I, I would like to find a way to avoid having a conversation where there's two sides, you know, where we always talk about the left, where we always talk about the right. And, and I think Richard had a, a wonderful point that there is no real major difference between the two. Um, I think the, the battle that needs to be drawn is not from, you know, people who might believe in, in uh, you know, self-label as conservative or self-label as liberal, but, uh, but from people who, who um, believe that giving power to government is a good thing versus people who believe that taking power from the government is a good thing. And I think that's, that's where we need to redraw the battle lines. There, now, I do think that because so much, so, so many of the people who re report what's the so-called news or create what's so-called the news, and so many people in publishing and entertainment um, are of the, the left wing uh, bias versus the right wing, even though the corporations are typically owned, at least except for, for the high tech ones in Silicon Valley by people who would formerly be labeled as conservative, that the bias is against um, um, you know what you, you know, what you might label as traditional American values in in some ways. Um, and certainly, if you look, you know, for example, I'm trying to get you know a couple of books published, and if you look at the the background of everybody in in the world of of uh, you know fiction publishing anyway, you will see from um, from you know, the kind of books they published to where they went to school to, you know, personal statements and all the rest of that, that, it, the, that, that there's a certain bias out there. So anything that they, they look at allowing through their filter for the general public to absorb goes through those biases. And so, um, 
you know, that's why the popular television we see is is all about cops uh, breaking the law, but it's in a, it's in a good cause, and you know, DAs cutting corners and and all the rest of that. So the bias the the bias is there. The idea that um, you know, the ACLU used to, I mean, Richard remembers, I think, um, I, I certainly remember when the ACLU used to defend people's liberties, especially First Amendment rights. Um, and the most, the most egregious thought was the most heavily defended because that they, their core belief at that time was that uh, open uh, dialogue uh, where, where any kind of, of crazy idea or notion or thought uh, deserved a voice because if you stifle those voices, then we run into you know what happened in in communist China or the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany or Zimbabwe or Venezuela or now here. So I think that's that's it. It's it's horrible. Um, and I think what we should be doing is is promoting outrageous voices so that people think. And and now you know we're we're being pitted against each other, like Richard says based upon uh, pretty superfluous, uh, pretty random things. Like, you know, the idea that, that uh, somehow Dr. Seuss stories are, uh, portray racial stereotypes and therefore any story that has uh, someone in a, in, a, in a grass skirt uh, can't be published or someone holding a bowl of rice and having, you know, uh, slits for eyes shouldn't be published, or all of, all the rest of that, and you know the even the idea that um, you know somehow uh, boys and girls sections in in uh, well anyway that's another subject. But I think I think I, I would like to see people welcome um, outrageous ideas rather than be offended. Yeah, yeah. the the uh, the original you mentioned the use uh, ACLU their original free speech case was defending Nazis right to march in a Jewish community in Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, that wouldn't happen today. Would not yeah. happen today. No. Uh, and, and, and that, you know, and, and uh, it's George Orwell's prophecy, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, I probably will get it pro somewhat wrong, but he said those who control history control the future. Mm -hmm. And what's happening with cancel culture, people are trying to control the, uh, control history, control what's being said about what has happened that's controlling history, so that they, the cancelers, can control the future because mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, point of view, their point of view on what is historical, uh, defines what is uh, allowable and what is uh, okay going forward. Well, how are we supposed to understand the journey? How are we supposed to understand the journey of where we've come from if we can't go back and look? One of the things we've taken about, you know, every city has a right to have their own statues and decide what goes in their own town squares. And people said, well, if we take them down, it's fine because you can still go to books and you can still look in the books and you can still read about history, but they're taking the books away now. They're mm -hmm. sitting there saying, you can't read the books that have these references to how people used to talk and how people used to draw pictures because we've now find them offensive, mm -hmm. but they well, weren't yeah, strong enough. They weren't strong enough images. They weren't strong enough ideas to keep us from staying, to keep us from evolving past them. So they're clearly not strong enough to drag us back there. That's very yeah, Mark Twain wouldn't get published today because his novels, Huckleberry Finn and, and Tom Sawyer included, you know, used the N-word. And Mark Twain was one of the most anti-racist writers of his time. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's self-defeating as well. Well, and I think that, that I, I agree with both of you, and that was a very good point, James. Um, what, what, galls me is that people on the one hand who talk about, you know, cancel culture and racism, uh, then proceed to identify people's goals, needs, wants, and values based upon the color of their skin or their gender. So um, when, when you can get people to do battle along those lines, they, they forget to talk about what Richard brought up earlier, which is you know why are we uh, why are we bombing targets in Syria? Um, you know why are we spending uh, money that we don't have? Uh, you know that's COVID relief. What a what a bunch of crap! It's not a COVID relief plan. They still haven't they still they haven't, still haven't spent, spent they still haven't they spent still all the money they stole last time. So uh, I mean it's. You know the important things aren't being talked about because the uh, the the whether it's the deep state or whoever it is, 
um, is succeeding in making us focus on or feeding us only things that are, you know, basically the way somebody parts their hair. You know, that we're fighting about that when we need to take a real look at, at what this massive bureaucracy that has power over th everything um, is doing. And, and, you know, that's the, you know, we're being, we're being uh, shiny, shiny bracelet, shiny bracelet, look at shiny bracelet while somebody's picking our pocket. And yeah, and, I mean, in the, in, to get back to the, you know, the original crux of what's being canceled, the answer to bad speech or bad act, bad speech is good speech, con mm -hmm. counter speech. That's, mm -hmm. that's the answer, not, not uh, uh, censoring bad speech. It's, you know, providing the, the alternative, providing the, uh, the rebuttal, the, uh, the counter, the counterpoint, as you, which yeah. is what we do. Yeah. Well, an individual piece of is, of cancel is not is like a piece of straw. It's not very heavy. It doesn't really matter. But a bale of straw weighs a lot, and it takes a lot to carry it around. And so when we just you know talk about cancel culture, you know, Dr. Seuss or a statue or Abe Lincoln individually doesn't matter. But over time, we're going to have this big, huge pile of canceled that you know we're not going to be able we're going to have to figure out what to do with and speaking of figuring out what to do with andrew cuomo governor of new york is uh falling into the hole of his own making he his own lies deceptions and personal behaviors are finally coming home to roost and what is interesting to watch is many of us even from three thousand miles away are going what took them so long to figure this out hmm. well i think i think there's some you know it when when you you know uh, let a a uh, politically powerful family member be interviewed by his brother on what's supposed to be the news, and uh, have him write you know uh, press releases basically that are propaganda pieces, and then give him an Emmy for them, and then have him control investigating questions about his behavior by appointing people that do the investigating. Have I left anything out? Uh, you're, you're pretty much doomed to have uh, crazy go on. And now it's being, uh, now it's being brought forth. I, I, I think there's a really interesting quote um, where there's, there's three at least uh, stories coming up, out about uh, women staffers being harassed by, uh, uh, what's his first name? Cuomo? I don't know. Andrew. Anyway, Andrew. No, I keep Is getting it? him mixed up with his brother, though. Yeah, the, I get their, the, I get the their talking, whole family the mixed talking up. talking head. And, and his defense to it was that I never inappropriately touched a woman. So the questions weren't that he was being slapped around about weren't you know did you grope this woman or whatever they were about you know his behaviors making people uncomfortable and and overtures and innuendo and all the rest of that and he responded by saying you know that's like you walking up and punching somebody and when somebody gets mad about you say i didn't shoot him you know so uh it's it's he's still trying to control the dialogue and and he's he's being caught when when uh, part of the, the political power circle, uh, I think there, there's a Democratic uh, attorney general in, in, um, in New York State going after him. Uh, they're starting to turn on him. There's, there's uh, major Democrats, whatever that means, asking you know, him to either resign or step down or issue an apology, all the rest of that. I think that's a very good sign. I mean, we saw the yeah. same thing with if, if you know, the behavior that – that Bill Clinton did uh, was okay because he was a Democrat. And it wasn't until maybe 20 years later, they said, well, maybe we shouldn't have been support so supportive of, of Bill being a dog, a hound. Uh, I can't say what kind of hound, but, um, you know, and, and it was okay because he was, he was a Democrat. But, and you know, you know Weinstein, that's, it's interesting. Weinstein we're, the we're, same thing, you know. We're, we're looking at, at politicians being, uh, sexual predators, essentially. And what we're really talking about is people of power or in positions of power uh, being sexual predators. And it goes back a long way. So it goes back as far as LBJ, uh, JFK, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, certainly Donald Franklin Trump. Donald Roosevelt. Yeah, FDR. Donald I mean, all of, all of the, all of the, uh, the big, the, the, the names who are so uh, popular that, they're, that we know them by their, by their initials. 
uh, all of them were, or most of them, or many of them were sexual predators. Mm -hmm. Why are they able to get by with being sexual predators? Because they're in a position of power. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's luckily, or, or uh, I think uh, admirably, starting to end a little bit as a result of the Me Too movement. And I think we should applaud that. I think we should say, good. Uh, Clinton got what he was, what was coming to him eventually. So did uh, Trump. So did uh, you know by not being reelected, and so now is Obama who might get impeached or certainly not reelected. I think we have to thank, and and I don't thank him for the 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 aberrant aberrant behavior. Uh, is it Harvey Weinstein? Uh, really, he was a uh, he was from from you know what's come out a filthy filthy man. And who used his position of power in in an industry where, you know, the, the controlling the purse strings and who gets a part and who gets funded and what gets publicity and all the rest of that and capital, and and he was untouchable for years and years and years because he was a huge political donor. They they ignored the bad things he did because he wrote big checks, and then once people started coming forward, they went, oh, well maybe we shouldn't have ignored those things. Uh, despite the despite the big checks, and that that seemed to open the floodgate, and that was right during the time of the Me Too. So, you know, I'd I'd love to to see a day where there where a young boy or a young girl can can uh, where that where the word casting couch will have to be explained to them, um, and and um, in the entertainment entertainment industry, and you know, and I I think that's the wonderful thing about capitalism. Versus versus the power in government. Now Weinstein was in you know in media, but um, uh, capital is colorblind. Capital doesn't doesn't care what what sex you are, what your sexual orientation is, what your religion is. Capital cares about how it's treated, and and you know a capitalist doesn't care whether you're a little green man from Mars, or whether you're white or black, white like rice, uh, or whatever. If you take it and massage it and make more of it, it has little babies, more money are created, then you're well loved. And so um, I think, you know, the big, the big plan for us, if we want to improve the world, is to, is to get autocratic power out of the way and let the, the power of the market uh, make sure that people are treated evenly and fairly with respect. Okay, well, I think this... this the second part of the story is that the news media knew all this and ignored it while sitting there claiming that they cared about lies. And we can't have respect. If How are you supposed to have respect if no one's telling you the truth? Well, Does I respect another, starts with the truth? I think another benefit of all of this is that people are distrustful of experts now and they're distrustful of the media and they need to be distrustful of experts. And they need to be distrustful of the media. And maybe, you know, that will filter through and they'll become as distrustful of the greatest evil, which is uh, autocratic government, you know, people who are untouchable. And, and there are starting to be more and more uh, people talking about getting rid of qualified immunity. You know, Justin Amash brought, brought forth a, uh, um, a bill to get rid of it. And then the person who's now carrying basically the same bill with their name on it is is completely 180 degrees opposed to almost everything Justin Amash ever did, but the concept that people in positions of power, people that hold guns or or can take uh, government money and move it around, should be held to at least the same standard as a, as a, a civilian is a wonderful thing. So I think, you know, despite the cancel culture and everything, maybe there's light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm too much of an optimist. I don't know. Hey, well, maybe there is some room for optimism if you're kind of want to hold the government accountable. The recall Newsom milestone, they've hit like 2,000, 2 million signatures, they say. <laughs> and they go through a process where they're having a private company verify this before they send them off to this to be verified by the government. So they're saying they're up at 2 million now, which means theoretically the, the recall is a high probability. That we are going to, yeah, know, which which you know, which puts us back into the you know the duel between uh, blue and red, and I'm not sure that there's a uh, viable uh, or even attractive uh, candidate who can actually beat uh, Newsom in a recall election, particularly when there are three or four who are going to be making that effort. They'll split the anti-Newsom vote, and Newsom will probably uh, end up winning uh, in a recall election, and that. Uh, well, it's, you know, it becomes kind of kind of pointless at some point. 
Well, I think with the difference in in um, and voter registration being what twenty two percent Democrat versus you know Republican, and oh by the way, most people don't really line up with either one of those parties, but they're convinced that they have to vote for A and B. How about C? None of the above. Or that no, how about D? Libertarian. The sure well, no, no. Um, how about we just sure move there'll be a libertarian, libertarian like candidate a. running running for governor, and that that is where any intelligent vote needs to go. Well, the the you know when when you have the nanny state and people being convinced uh, that um, you know especially it really really bothers me that the people who are most affected by the ineptness and the skullduggery of government are the people who are most firmly convinced that government is their only hope. You, know, you have people, uh, you know, holding teachers up in in as as icons of truth and justice, yet uh, those teachers are making three times the money they'll ever make and, and will retire way earlier than they ever will uh, to a lifestyle they'll never see, um, but they're untouchable. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, I can't see anybody beating them in an election, but, you know, the recall itself sends a message and, um, you know, that message is that, that at least 2 million people were upset enough with you to, uh, to go out of their way to write something down and challenge you. And the nice thing about the political process is you don't have to, you don't have to win an election to damage bad government. You simply yeah, have to, yeah. I mean, have to, I mean, certainly, yeah. certainly the recall election will have the, uh, unintended or perhaps intended consequence of modifying the governor's behavior and making him think twice about some of the silly stuff that he uh, has uh, has been doing and would do in the future. I hope yeah. So. Well, they're so dependent. They so focus so much on feeding their activists, feeding the people who write them checks that they're ignoring the average person and the average person is saying, hey, enough of this. Pay enough attention to what you're supposed to be doing. And I think, you know, they're, they're, the, the little bit that I read about it said uh, that um, you know, the schools will be open by the time the election happens, but the pain is going to last forever. I mean, parents watching their children stumble for a year, a year they might never catch up on, while during the whole time Gavin Newsom was sending his kids to a private school, uh, that, kind of, that kind of corrupt thinking, uh, you know, the pain people felt where, where, where you know, one person in the household would have to stop working so that they could homeschool their kids, um, while you know these these politicians partied and you know and went to Hawaii and and you know ate at the, one of the most expensive restaurants on the planet and their kids are all going to school and the fact that uh, just about half of public uh, school teachers send their kids to private schools. I mean these messages. I, I hope eventually that the voting populace realizes that there's that there's something wrong. Uh, and don't buy into the propaganda. And so um, I, I, I think it will do some good. Well, anyway. let's hope so, because yeah. as we're all sitting here struggling and with dealing with the coronavirus and putting our lives back together, what they're doing down at the state capitol is they're ex examining passing a law to ban boys and girls departments in major in major department stores. Yeah. Yes, because, you know, that's the major problem of our of our time is deciding uh, which way to manufacture future society? It's this whole you thing. Know, I, I, I have I have two daughters who are very strong women, uh, both of them uh, in business uh, and uh, successfully in business and entrepreneurial and all the rest. And I I support a very very strong role for women. My mother was a strong woman. She ran ran our, you know the family business when I was growing up. I think strong women uh, and uh, and equally strong men is to be uh, admired. What I don't think is that uh, whether somebody plays with dolls, if that's their preference, or plays with tractors or trucks, if that's their preference, has uh, a discernible long-term impact. Let kids play with what the hell they want to play with. Uh, we don't need to be, uh, at the state level, micromanaging what kids can play with, what toys they can play with. Parents can do that. Certainly kids will figure it out on their own, what they would rather play with. and. And, and let individualism uh, flourish and flower at a very young age rather than uh, creep out when people are, you know, past the age where they can actually do something about it. No, no I, I, absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I'm getting some interference from somewhere on my 
my end. I, I think what's hilarious is, so they're actually going to make it more difficult for people to make consumer choices. So if, if you're looking for a bra, uh, I fortunately don't need one. I haven't gained that much weight yet, despite, you know, sitting 20 feet from my refrigerator for, for most of the uh, pandemic. Um, I, I think as consumers, you would want to, to see signage that said somewhere that led you to where there's bras. And if you're, you know, uh, looking for an athletic supporter, you might want to see the same thing. Um, you know, human bodies are, 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 the male and female bodies are different. Clothing cut for a man doesn't sit well on, on typical woman and vice versa. Uh, there are certain seams that have to be in different places and all the rest of that. So the idea that, that um, you know, somehow this is going to help people um, stay away from, a, from, from a forced biases about uh, gender norms or whatever is just ludicrous. It's another shiny bracelet being held up to distract. And I, I don't know, is it is just boys and girls or men's and women's department? Uh, does the nanny state think that? that no, it's, it's, for it's, 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 it's for the children. It's for the children. It's for the children. It's for the children, it's for the children okay. John. It's always for the children. But yeah. uh, here's what I don't understand. You're complaining about artificial social constructs. So you're going to mandate an artificial social construct. You're actually <laughs> doing the exact same thing you're complaining about. You're literally imposing an artificial social construct on people through the law rather than mm -hmm. through just kind of generic social pressures is how cultures and civilizations evolve. You're mm -hmm. literally doing the exact same thing you're complaining about, but 10 times worse because you're forcing this view on, of other people on your view of, uh, of life on other people. It's you're literally taking exactly what you complaining about and say, I'm going to do more of that and then claim I'm morally superior. It's well, that's we, we see that yeah, my, my, my view, my view of the way the world uh, works is correct. Therefore, I'm going to force my view of the world on everybody by force of law. It's, you know, it's, it's arrogance and it's a uh, uh, lack of humility to the max. Yeah. Unlike, it, the, unlike the humble and uh, uh, people on this panel who are full of humility. We're, we're, yeah. Well, well, John, we may be arrogant. We may think we're right, but we don't want to force everybody I else to live our way. I we're not saying that. <laughs> no, it being well, funny. Well, John, you know, we people, are. Yeah. <laughs> we do well, think no, we're I right. Think, I, I but think, we don't uh, think we're so right that we can force other people to live the way we want them to. Absolutely. That's the difference. I'm, remind, I'm reminded every day by my wife about how humble I need to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, my, my wife now, right now, I think standing about eight feet from me, and she reminds me more than once a day. That I need to, you know, understand who the, you know, the real decision maker is. Well, for around here, the real decision maker is the clock, and we are out of time. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you all for, for watching. Join us next week here at libertariancounterpoint.com on Facebook and all your various social media platforms. Good night. And please remember to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show in Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5.30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.